Good morning. Good morning. And welcome everyone. Uh, so just as we start here, there's been a bit of a controversy over whether we still need to wear masks or not. And um, because of the CDC's new recommendations, well, they're a few weeks old at this point, and the, after that um, new recommendation came out, the council met and the council decided to uh, continue the, the mask uh, request. Uh, so uh, if, if you have issues with that, then talk to your council members. Uh, so that's, Aggie's the only one here right now. <laughs> so attack her. <laughs> um, so Aggie, Cheryl, Davida, Debbie, yes. So, um, so that's that's why that's why the signs are still up, and that's why you know some some of us are are wearing masks today. So, anyway, that's that's what's happening with that. All right, we begin with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Draw to Christ, and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, Help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life in the world. Amen. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life. You are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen. Jesus into the building. This summer, we're going to be looking at different parts of worship and just reminding ourselves, why in the heck do we do what it is that we are doing? So the reason why we have candles and why we bring in the light um, as we sing our first reading, it is to symbolize that we are bringing the light of Christ into the church building. And then you remember what happens at the end of worship during our closing hymn? The candles are extinguished, but not the light. The light is carried out and we are to follow the light of Christ out 
of the building. So that's what the light is all about. I mean, you know, it, it creates nice ambiance and all that good stuff too. But uh, we don't do things just for ambiance in worship. We do things because they have specific meaning. And the candles and the way we bring in the light and the way we take the light out, it all has to do with the light of Christ in the world and we as the body of Christ then following Christ out into the world as we are sent forth to serve. All right, now we can sing. <laughs> Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Yeah. 
we do want to grow. So, okay. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. All powerful God, in Jesus Christ you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Reading from Genesis. They heard the sound of the Lord. So we do not lose heart. 
Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with the hands, eternal in the heavens. Word of God, Word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. What does it say? It says you. It, it's, it's you. Okay? All right. Have you ever done anything wrong? I sure know I have. I know all these adults around here. Yeah, they have. We all have. We all make mistakes. We all do things. 
things on purpose and not on purpose that are wrong. Things that God would not want us to do. And you might feel like um, that God could never forgive you for the things that you've done. Or maybe not forgive somebody else because you're really mad at them for something that they've done. Well, when, when you do something wrong and you don't face up to it, you separate yourself from God. You get farther and farther away. And it can feel like you're just going to stay there far away from God forever. But you see, the thing is, God doesn't work that way. I made you a little heart because God loves you. And God will always love you. And God will never abandon you. And so even though you might go far away, you know what God wants to do? All right, see if I can do this without hurting myself. God pulls you back in. You can run away. And God wants you back. God's never going to give up on you. You're never going to be completely broken off from God, even if you don't know God's around. God's there. God's waiting. God's going to bring you back. Because God loves you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that even though we might feel like we are far away from you, that we are still connected to you. And that even though we might think we can never go back, you are always pulling us back to you because you love us. Help us remember that and never give up on you because you never give up on us. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, you can go. When I was a teenager, uh, my parents and I went to Chicago, because I grew up in Indianapolis, and uh, so we went to Chicago to see a, an art exhibit of Monet's artwork. They had collected uh, as many as they could, and it was really amazing. And in that uh, exhibition, uh, there were these ginormous canvases that uh, Monet had done later on in his life, uh, interestingly enough, as he was going blind. Um, and they were giant pictures of water lilies in a pond. Now, the, the thing was that if you went right up to this ginormous thing and you looked at the canvas, all you'd see is blobs of paint and swirls of stuff. You couldn't make out what it was. But when you stood back, and I mean, these things were big, and I'm so, you, you really stood far back, you could see this crystal clear pond and these beautiful water lilies in the, the base of the leaf. Uh, coming up. It was really amazing. If you were standing too close, you couldn't see what it was. But when you stood back, you could see the beauty that this man created on the canvas. Our gospel lesson is kind of like those canvases of water lilies. Jesus has been preaching that the kingdom of God has come near. And what he means is he has come near. And he's been healing the sick. 
He's been lifting up the oppressed. He has been teaching about God's love. Many saw what was happening and they flocked to him because they needed that word that he was giving to them. But others, like the authorities, the scribes, they heard what Jesus was doing and they knew that it was a big problem. They saw what Jesus was doing as a threat to their power and prestige and authority. They called him Satan. They could only see through the lens of their own power and authority. And then there was Jesus' family, his mother, his brothers, his sisters. And they thought he was crazy. That's what everybody was telling them. They wanted to protect him from himself, take him away. They were too close to see who Jesus was. They were too close to see the Messiah in the baby that Mary nursed and the bottom that she had wiped. They were too close to see the big brother who probably was just like any other big brother, good, bad, and indifferent, that they had played with and eaten with they couldn't see the Messiah. They only saw the baby or the brother. They just knew him too well in some ways. But the crowd saw something different. They saw someone who taught in a different way. Someone who welcomed everyone, especially the outsiders. They saw someone who healed them and fed them. When they listened, they didn't hear threat or craziness. They heard good news. One part of the reading this morning that always makes people nervous is whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven. And throughout the history of the church, um, the church has done great harm, actually, to people uh, pointing to this particular verse. Um, because for the longest time, it was understood that suicide was a um, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. And so that's why, for centuries, you could not be buried in holy ground if you had died by suicide. That's not at all what Jesus was talking about here, and yet the church, um, as I said, did great harm uh, not understanding. What this really means is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is to attribute the work of God to Satan. And in so doing, being beyond the reach of any kind of persuasion to the contrary. I mean, that was the scribes. They, they did not understand. They didn't want to understand. It comes down to Jesus' identity. Who was he? Who is he? And the irony is that the demons knew exactly who Jesus was. They knew. They didn't have faith in him. They didn't trust him. They didn't follow him. But they knew who he was. And they were afraid of him. Those good religious leaders and his family didn't know. They couldn't see because they were too close, either to their own power and authority or too close to the human being that they had known as a little one. 
The church has experienced repeatedly this kind of behavior throughout history. If there's something new, something different, it's vilified, it's named as Satan, it's excommunicated. And we as Lutherans should understand this very well because Martin Luther, what happened to him when he saw problems in the church that needed to be changed? What happened? He was vilified. He was called crazy. He was called Satan. He was excommunicated. They would have killed him if they'd had the opportunity. But then the reality is that Luther and also Lutherans, good Lutherans, good people, throughout history have turned around and done the same thing. Martin Luther, you should hear, uh, read his writings on Anabaptists. Oh man, they should have a, a rock tied around them and thrown into a lake and drowned. Those Anabaptists, the Quakers, and the, the Baptists, and all others like that. He vilified them. He wanted them dead. He called them Satan. Just the same. And my point is that this isn't just something that bad people do. This is something that we all do at some point or another. We see something either we don't understand or we don't know or is different from us and our immediate response is it's wrong. During this last year, we've done a really good job of doing all of the things. Vilifying, calling Satan, uh, excommunicating. Through the pandemic, through racial upheavals, through election year politics, we have demonstrated the reality of this human behavior again and again, again and again. With violence and demonizing and calling crazy being common. And as we emerge then back into the public, where will the church be? What will the church do? Will we, the body of Christ, choose to vilify, to demonize, and excommunicate? Or will we seek reconciliation? Will we listen more than speaking says the preacher who is making you all listen to me instead of me listening. Living in the faith of Christ is not based on knowledge because remember those demons, they knew who Jesus was. Living the life in Christ is about trusting, trusting Christ and following what Jesus did. So what are we going to do? Amen.
before the triune God in prayer. God of wholeness, we pray for believers all over the globe. Unify us in service of the gospel that we may work together as beloved siblings to share your love with all. Lord, in your mercy. God of the cosmos, we pray for creation, the gardens, waterways, and creatures near to us, and diverse forms of life that remain unseen. Teach us to treat the natural world with reverence, seeking restoration when human divisions have caused harm to your beloved creation. Lord, in your mercy. God of all people, we pray for harmony among the nations. Cast out from us unclean spirits of greed and fear, that we may work in solidarity with one another for the common good. Lord, in your mercy. God of abundance, we pray for those who are oppressed or in any need. Encourage those who have begun to lose heart. Strengthen and renew us with your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. God of righteousness, we pray for this holy house of worship. Set our gaze upon things eternal, that in thanksgiving for your mercy, we may extend grace to more and more people. Lord, in your mercy. For what else do the people of God wish to pray? Lord, in your mercy. God of the ages, in your goodness you have sent us faithful witnesses for every time and place. We give you thanks. For those saints who now rest in your eternal mercy. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayer to you, O oh God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. So we, we pass that peace safely here. And at home, of course, you can touch each other. So this is the time in the worship when we uh, uh, would normally have been passing the plate. Um, and so it's at this time that I want to say thank you to everyone who has continued to support the ministries of this congregation. And yes, you're allowed to sit down. <laughs> um, thank you uh, for your financial support. And um, it... Your financial support makes the ongoing ministries of our congregation possible. If you have not had an opportunity to give, or if it's been a while since you've given, there's no time like the present, and there's lots of ways to do it. You can write a check, mail it to the church. You can use your bank's bill pay. You can uh, use our website, we have a secure page. There's a donate button that takes you to a secure page and you can enter your information there and give from the website. You can also download the Give Plus app on your phone and uh, give directly from your phone. So lots of ways to do it. Now let us pray our offertory prayer. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. All right, before we uh, go forward, does everybody have your little... Some people are calling them jiggers, <laughs> communion jiggers, <laughs> shot glasses, 
they're chalices. That's what they are. So you, um, if you've been here before, you may have noticed that they're different. We have different ones now. So you're not going to have to try to flip that, that cellophane off the top, which was a real hassle and made for a very interesting noise. But so you have bread on one side and you have wine on the other side. This is wine. We've had grape juice up until this point. Um, and so all you'll have to do is peel off one side, eat the bread, and peel off the other side and drink the wine. So it's much easier to handle. All right, are we ready to give this a try? And those of you at home, have your bread and wine ready.
the blood of Christ shed for you. Developed pneumonia. So that's all, and that's all I know at this point. All right. Well, if there are no other announcements, then let us continue with our sending hymn and let's watch Jesus lead us forth from the building.
Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.